good afternoon. Happy Valentine's Day. We have a happy Valentine's special. It's a very, very special program. My name is Dmitry Sitkovetsky, and this is Q&A with Dima Transformation, the Art of Reinvention in the Time of the Pandemic. And I do have very, very special uh, guests today, my two favorite musicians in the NAS, also the longest serving. They were there at the very beginning of the uh, New European Strings Orchestra all the way back in 1990. And of course, it's Yoko Fujita, who is speaking to us from Zurich today in Switzerland, and Kati Reitinen, who is speaking from Stockholm. So welcome, Yoko and Kati. Wonderful to have you here. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh, I also have beautiful, beautiful flowers here to oh. both of you and to all our friends. As Kati mentioned, that uh, Valentine's Day in Finland means something else. Could you explain? Yeah, it's called how... uh, Friends. It's Friends Day. It's not uh, the Lover's Day, but a day with friends or for friends. friends. Wonderful. We, we certainly, we certainly now in the, entering the age where the friends and love for friends become more more important than just one person as a love. I think we. And, and since Aeneas is such a, a really labor of love for me and for most people there, so I feel that it's very appropriate for Aeneas. So let me ask you the first question. Uh, you probably never spend as much time at home as in 2020. What new have you learned about yourself during the pandemic? What has been a positive lesson from being at home? Kati, you start. Um, uh, evenings at home. Oh, beautiful, Yoko. <laughs> I mean, when, when you work at an opera house and you have a busy schedule otherwise too, then the evenings at home, they just don't happen very often. So this year has been actually fantastic. It's amazing. Do people live like this? They really meet each other every <laughs> evening. <laughs> No, it's it's been I've appreciated that to get to learn learn to know my family a little bit, and then there's been another another find for me. I've always been a bit uh, scared of teaching because of the responsibility for the whole person for the life, not only the musical life, but but you can ruin so much if you're stupid and <laughs> even if you're not, just by mistake. But this year. Um, I finally did it. I started to meet some pupils at the Royal College here, and it's been great. It's been fantastic. It's really a, an, an, an adventure. And also it, it's brought my, me back to my teachers and uh, I'm, I'm feeling so grateful for everything they have done for me and uh, what I can just give on to other people. It's, it's been really wonderful. And uh, so, but that's for about the, the good sides of the pandemic. We don't have to go into the other sides now. <laughs> the other sides are plenty, plenty. Yes. What about you, Yoka? What, what, what has it been for you? Well, being, being at um, home for so long? You know, that's like, I had this uh, um, accident in 2002. It's already almost 20 years ago with my ear. And since then, sort of I'm, um, I started to live more introverted life. That means like I, I worked, I used to work 50% in symphony orchestra, 50% uh, freelance. And then this orchestra part finished and then I had to, you know, find myself how to daily contact with, with musicians and, and colleagues. And, and so from that um, matter, so, my life hasn't changed that much. You know, like, like Kathy enjoying the family life or whatever. And these things, but so, but even more time and there's no excuse to face to the problem, whatever daily life that's um, no, 
no excuse for not having time and no energy to face your problems. And then, and so for that, I really with digesting my active ears and all the repertoire or this discipline, physical and, and mental, that I really learned very much in this um, one year, even more. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting because you both uh, have to, we have to, by having so much time and for reflection and for recollection, it would be interesting to uh, go back to your beginnings, both of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, for Yoko, uh, somebody asked specifically, uh, how did this, the specific training you received at Curtis contribute to your enjoyment of performing with NES? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I would go back even further, let's say from the beginning, because there's, there's an interesting fact in your biography that at the very beginning, you actually studied with Mr. Suzuki himself. And if you don't mind just going back to that part, then maybe touching a little bit on Curtis and then we'll, we'll ask Kathy of her beginnings. Yeah. So a little okay. bit about. Um, I, yes. <laughs> I was, my father was, uh, uh, I come from a non-musician's family. And then uh, because right. of my father's work, we moved to the place where Mr. Suzuki was living and teaching. And at that time I was about three and a half. My brother was playing violin, so, and I didn't go to the kindergarten. So I got this instrument and, and started to, to play with instrument a little bit. And then my mother who was born 1925, I recognized that the year of your father's birth year. <laughs> and then, <laughs> And then, you know, she was sort of growing up in this wartime and then uh, they had not nice youth and also women is only to be served as a, as a wife, not a personality. Yeah. So, and when she heard, yeah, mm -hmm. and when she had this, this um, so-called motto from Suzuki method, I, I will read it. Musical ability yes. is not an inborn talent, but an ability which can be developed. Any child who is properly trained can develop musical ability just as all children de develop the ability to speak their mother tongue. The potential of every child is unlimited. And I think this, this uh, um, motto, I think, it, talk to her very much. So, and it, so she said, okay, well, there's, there's a possibility to, to be near for, to, to start, send her there. And, but I, I really don't remember him as a person, not much. When I think about now, he was that time on the beginning of 60 and that much younger than us, <laughs> but um, he, <laughs> he was very, fine person and then listen and he praised what you do yes and that was a lot of compliments a lot of yeah. compliments for every yeah. effort not for the result but for the effort exactly well. and yeah, also well. all the mothers or father who accompany their that their children they had to also hold the body and that they had to learn also and play you know it's it's sort of when i Imagine now it must be horrible, but it very something very positive about it, and then uh, that was really wonderful, I have to say. But and then with, with, with uh, so, but only what I feel still I was pity is was people in Japan like who went to Toho or Gedai, everybody said how nice you didn't get involved with this school system or that, but. Till I go to, I went to Curtis. I never had any institutional training, musical training, and then that so was something very. After Suzuki, you continued 
just privately. You went to normal schools and had your music exactly. classes. Exactly. Uh -huh. And then when I was like 10, I, the, the, we, we moved back to Osaka and then our Suzuki teacher was not so, so good for me. And so, so I changed the, the, to the other uh, professor. But I, my parents anyhow never want me to be a professional musician. <laughs> so they said, okay, you go to the normal school and then do the normal education. And when you finish your maturity with 18, still you wanted to do it, then go for it. But till then you have to stay home and get the normal thing. So and go to normal school, but you, you, you kept on of practicing the violin and, and yes and yes with, but with, i had with, no with chance practice. of playing chamber music neither orchestra because my professor in that time in osaka she was against it she said no you you don't have to do that you have to just practice your violin you know <laughs> and try to get over with this professor i had to go to abroad not to get fight or, or, you know, this, uh, she was, she couldn't let me go anywhere. So I had to go to so, a road. That was really so easy. you came to Curtis when you were already out of the school at 18, you, you moved to 19, the States? I was 90 because I was after, uh, after school, I was first in Paris ah. and in Nice in the Corgan uh, master course. Oh, and then uh, he said um, he could he can't take me to the to the Moscow, so I should go to Prague, and that was a time direct, uh, right after from Prague spring. Spring. And my parents was very worried, and yeah. uh, so I got chance to play for Grumio, who was my idol all time that time, and then I went to him in Brussels, and uh, but he was not teaching in the school so uh -huh. so afterwards yeah i really wanted to go to the music school and then uh, the um then right after that i got chance that um jamie laredo invite me to pray for him so i went to play for him and then i went to but you played you met him in europe or jamie no i went I went. no no he was uh, i went you from brussels to to um, New York to play for him, and then uh, that time, I, yeah, that was quite an adventurous uh, trip. But uh, that was um, I was lucky to be able to play for him, and he he accepted me, and then I started in Curtis night seventy five. So yeah, seventy five. That's fantastic. So you were about uh, the same age, a nineteen, when you came to Curtis when. Uh, when I met Kati, and I met Kati <laughs> when she had and yes, yeah, so true. I know Kati from that age. Uh, but tell us, Kati, what you did before that. How how did you start, and who were your teachers before we met? Hmm. I'm hmm. also from a non-musical family, so to say, and uh, <clears throat> I played the piano first, and I hated it, <laughs> and uh, then I got to change for cello, started cello when I was nine, and there was a Hungarian, uh, two brothers in Helsinki, in, in Eastern Helsinki where I was living, they had a youth orchestra and they were teaching their own version of the Kodai method. So actually it's a little bit similar to the Suzuki in the thought, I think, that there is a chance, there should be a chance for everybody to learn music that the most important person in the town is not the opera boss, but the teacher for the young children. That, that, that this, this person should be paid best. <laughs> paid, paid best, because they, these are the most important people exactly. in the business. The ones, your first teachers, because they exactly. eat you for life and then you drop it or become physically crippled because you were taught the wrong way to play, or they give you the and the way to never stop learning and never stop developing. Yeah, I, I would say absolutely. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, child, uh, children's doctors, I mean, the ones that really take care of you while you're the most vulnerable 
in a way, you know, it's the same, it's the same, the same thing. And then, uh, so who were your first teachers? You, you went to a Sibelius yeah, Academy first... or not? Yeah, I did. I went to the youth department there. So I was one year only in this uh, music school in the Eastern Helsinki. And then I went to the youth department, which is a fantastic thing because from the whole country, uh, children came there for Saturdays. So they could take a night train from Ivalo, I mean, from Rovaniemi, from wherever, and then they could have their lessons on Saturday with, with teachers they could otherwise not have met. And uh, mm -hmm. it still exists. And I hope really that Finland will keep this tradition. It's a fantastic possibility. And I had many, many good teachers. And the funny thing is that when I think of when we met, uh, when I was 19, then I was already studying in the, in the real Sibelius Academy. But that time, I mean, you, of course, you meet people, but it was there was no Spotify, there was no YouTube. So to get really to close contact with, with people who play differently, who, who are not, who have not studied in Eastern Helsinki. <laughs> exactly. I mean, th th this, this impact for me, I think I was 19 when I when I auditioned for you, but I think I actually was already 20 when we met then with the orchestra. <laughs> or oh, with the orchestra, by, by yeah. May, you, you might have 90. Exactly, you because might have I, my birthday 20. is April, so I think I was already April. Was old but I well. remember very well, you came to Turku. I was playing with Bezrodny, I think Shostakovich yeah. maybe, or Prokofiev concerto. And you came and you auditioned for me in, uh, I think Rosie arranged it. Rosie okay. Dubson, and you played for me in, in the back backstage somewhere. And I said, well, absolutely, please come. And this was uh, this was the time when I, I might have seen also Marku Jokinen, but you were you were the first one. And and it's so remarkable that you you've been such a lucky uh, you know draw for me because I think I will not be wrong that if I say that you've developed in the biggest way from where I found you in December 89 to what you became in the course that at first we, I saw you a lot because we did a lot of festivals, a lot of tours, but then even if I didn't see you with any else, I would come to home and this and that, and you just kept growing and growing and developing and developing and that constant it was just for me that's been one of the most uh satisfying uh pro if if one could call it a project uh kati writing the project maybe the most satisfying because of you know boris galitsky of course i know since we were both you know teenagers uh and he was already a great you know, he became maybe better and more experienced concert master and this and that. But the, your development, Yoko was already, you know, completely master violinist, but you were still sort of in the process of growing and just to, to observe that and to become. And this is, I think, the feeling many of us, Yoko, correct me if I'm wrong, because that Kati's development has been absolutely sensational. Well, it's such a pleasure to meet her each each uh, festival each tour that she's yeah uh, that's really oh, you're so it's sweet <laughs> and became a fantastic cellist and now you know when i experienced her also when we went to japan together play some chamber music she yeah. gave us yeah, lessons and how she teaches and then because mother, you know, everything. It's, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, she, the, the whole package, the whole package. Now, while well, she's blushing, but it's a good day for it for Valentine's. <laughs> you could tell me about when we met, <laughs> yeah, exactly, when we were both studying at uh, uh with the great uh, Galamian, you were this. Tell, tell me about the Curtis because the actual question was about uh, how the specific training you received at Curtis contribute to your enjoyment of performing with NES. As, uh, she's writing, in my memory, that training was intense and also deeply committed to the spirit of music like NES. Tell us a, a few things 
uh, about the Curtis years, yeah, which came when you you were the same age as when we met Kathy <laughs> at 19. I remember like when I came to Curtis, I was 19, one of the already old one, and then like Cecil or Sarah Saint Ambrosia and then uh, Nadia and, and all this Salerno, yeah. and the teenies and then I'm already 19 turning 20 and I came to Curtis I really know old. nothing about and then it was really I, I had to start with from Kreuzel <laughs> once more and then um Second year, third year, then I'm allowed to play chamber music, and then uh, I could Misha Schneider, uh, Felix Gani, Isidro Court. I mean, that was fantastic teachers around. And then what I can compare with um, Ness is there's no rivality or competitor, you know, just you have such a respect to your colleague and then you get such an influence you just sucked in and you really really like a um, sponge it's nothing you can really exactly. take it and then work together and also learning quite short period of time very intensive very concentrated and you have to bring to the performance which also occurred is we had yeah. to see is you had to you learn pieces and then um, you are able to perform in, in the hall in the house and then this is yeah. also with uh, Ness there, there are some also many people came and go on to also but certain people stays in the group and then then such a productive sometimes it's such a difficult because yeah, yeah. but n never unpleasant you know it's just that with all the time you are treated with respect and that is something very 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 you know, i miss this working process with with uh, ness yeah. You know, yeah but i i think it's it's also from what I remember, because we had not only Galamin uh, uh, among the teachers in common, we also had, uh, you know, Galimer, Felix Galimer. Uh, he was a very, very special uh, mm -hmm. musician, and you became very good friends with him because you saw Felix much later already in Europe, and he would come and you would, you would keep in touch with him and his wife and Felix I remember when I played chamber music and I he had a strat at that time and I was so excited because I said that Mr. Gallimer can I try your strat and you know so he gave me his strat it was not the easiest actually violin to play but somehow I managed I said oh that's so exciting he said don't worry he said don't worry soon you'll have your own <laughs> at that time, it was like, yeah, you'll be you'll 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 be on Mount Everest, yeah, one of these days but soon, you know. But it didn't take that long for me to have a strat. He was sort of, you know, prophetic in some ways, but um, it it there was wonderful, also personalities. Everybody had, you know, Galamin had a fatherly. Uh, fatherly quality in him, and uh, he, I think Felix also was kind of a, a father figure to you in many ways. You know, they were not just mm -hmm. not just uh, teachers in chamber music or, 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 or violin. They were they were much more mentor kind of uh, you know role models in many ways. And of course, Felix, you know, if Galamin brought. Uh, Russian and French tradition. Then Felix brought tradition directly from Schomburg. He actually played Schomburg pieces with Schomburg in attendance. I mean, he was he was direct linked to New Viennese school. I mean, and all that great culture. So I think we were lucky that way. In the meantime, while we're talking, I just want to uh, you be aware that we have uh, a text going on 
between Boris Galitsky, girls, we miss you. <laughs> <laughs> and he signs Paris prisoners, of course. <laughs> and then, yeah, oh, that's... And Susan Roberts says, me too. You are the best of what music and music making is about. That's a big compliment. Wonderful. I couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly right. Now, let me just jump to, uh, yeah, this interesting question, for instance, for Kati. Because you started at 19 with an AS, which we already said, as the youngest player and progressed enormously as a solo cello at the Royal Opera in Stockholm. You have a string trio of great quality, which I played together. We did Shostakovich Quartet, Opus 73, which is very dear for the NAS as well because of the transcription. Contemporary music you do a lot and now teaching. Uh, what it doesn't say here, you also have two wonderful boys, one of whom is a movie star. So now you're a mom of a movie star. That's incredible. The question is, what is your drive and motivation? Who were your mentors and role models? Because we talked about a little bit of role models for your call and me too. Uh, who were your mentors and role models? And then also mention your three, four favorite operas. So two, two things. What drives you? Who were your sort of mentors and, uh, and, and role models? And then maybe operas. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to think it's love of music, which is driving me, but of course it's other things too. And there's some kind of curiosity which I've not lost yet, uh, which is, I'm also very happy for. Uh, and also, it's very important for me to, to keep the possibility of doing many different things. So not only sitting in the orchestra or not only this or only that, but really mix, mix this uh, musicians, uh, all the possibilities that there are. And that has always been really important even when it's terribly busy and uh, and so <clears throat> that's a really nice thing and mentors well i think you too you are on the top <laughs> in but it's also so much not only learning from a teacher don't you think it's how you see other people are handling their lives and it's not maybe musicians at all it can be your friends i mean i have to say that my good dear friend susanna melki whom i've been really good friends since we were seven and and exactly. she's of course she has been a great influence in in many ways and then there are these these occasions when the coincidence plays in that that, that the, i played a master course in helsinki uh, a long time ago i, I was not i was maybe I was like around 20 and uh, there was a cellist from the Helsinki Philharmonic was listening to the to the master course. Her name is Rita Lampela. And uh, she came to me after the course and she said, you have to go abroad. You can't stay in Finland. You have to get away from here. You have to go somewhere else to study. And I was like, why? I like it here. I don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> but I think she actually, she opened the thought and I'm very grateful for that. Isn't that also one of the things in Ness that nobody in Ness is living in the country where they were born? <laughs> Just about. It's, we're the most displaced people, uh, exactly. group of displaced people. I mean, we have, we have French uh, musicians, uh, well, people living in, in France, but they're not French. Boris, no. Mimi, <laughs> Boris, Boris, no. We have a bunch of Dutch citizens. Uh, maybe one now we have who is actually Dutch. <laughs> you know, we had <laughs> people living in London. They're not. And look, I'm talking now to uh, Yoko, who is from Japan, but she lives in Switzerland. And I'm talking to Kati, who is Finnish, but you've lived most of your life in Stockholm. We are yeah. the most, and of course, I am a typical British, uh, you know, musician anyway, <laughs> if you believe that. Uh, yeah. So anyway, but I think that just also shows that music has really knows no borders. And we go where we feel at home because of our family situation and where we could 
express ourselves, you know, who knows, you know, I lived in Germany, that's a great place for musicians. And now my daughter, if it were not for pandemic, she would have spent the whole year in Germany, in Dusseldorf and, uh, you know, Dresden. Susan, mm -hmm. if I didn't, you know, make her come to London, she now maybe would be uh, coming to the end of her career, only now. So, because it's the, the retirement age for, the, for this. Uh, in the meantime, while we're talking about it, Boris is asking, Kati, are you still running? Yes. I mean, <laughs> He's a big runner. <laughs> yeah. There's too much You're snow and ice now, but so I'm I'm uh, skiing at the moment, cross country. But I'm running. When the snow and ice is gone, then I will run. Come to yeah, Stockholm run with me. <laughs> because Boris is a complete uh, ru runner fanatic. But uh, but uh -huh. one thing that Kat does that neither Boris nor I, most of any else, could only be, could only just roll their eyes. You went to sauna and <laughs> dipped into a ice cold water in the yes. sea, right? That's yes. just yes. on Friday. That that for me <laughs> <Yes>. is unbelievable. <laughs> well just please give it a go. Just try it's fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, well, what 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 could go wrong? Just an instant heart attack. Other than that, if you don't get it, that's fine. You live you live a long time. It's the best way it. to go. <laughs> of course. Oh yeah, it's a great way to go. <laughs> Much better than from COVID. Yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah. Yoko, tell me uh, now. For, uh, for uh, you've experienced, of course, three different. Uh, way of, you know, three different, very important th uh, three musical cultures. You mm -hmm. come from Japan. For me, that's one of the best places to, to come. And you've been there on a number of my tours would coincided or you were there on a family visit. I love going to Japan. I've been there 15 times. Of course, the states that we have in common and Europe. Uh, where do you feel you belong musically or what uh, influences, mm -hmm. what great qualities that you've brought from different cultures? Because there are three different worlds. Now, of course, they're very interchanging and you could find a lot of Japanese musicians in European orchestras and, and so forth. But how would you describe what was really good and what you don't miss, <laughs> you, know, you know, in all those three. Well, Japan, um, it's my country, but still I have problem, often problems dealing to be an individual over there. It's, you have to, you have to fit into very much as a woman too. And then uh, um, it's not easy for me. It's not easy. And then uh, USA was a great place for me um, to study. And, but obviously I spent about seven months in Europe before I moved to, to America. I get this air and culture, and I feel I feel very comfortable with it. And then uh, way of uh, life in America was, I mean, I was only five years there, only five years of my life. But this uh, influence was just incredible, and also this this opportunity, you know, they actually so generous to give the chance to some. They thought, thought of talented musician. Let's give a chance to study here, free. Curtis is uh, all the, the or we get whole full scholarship, and then it's it's uh, this American generosity. It's it's. Uh, I never felt over there. I'm a foreigner. When I moved to uh, Bamberg first time. I recognize I don't actually belong here. <laughs> that was the first time I really recognized I, I 
am a foreign stranger. That I am a foreigner. You felt like a and foreigner. Then, oh, totally, totally. I was a symphoniker and who plays in the Bamberger Symphoniker, but I was not Yoko, whether I mean, it's, it's just a stranger. And then, um, but I guess I was so in many terms naive and I didn't know anything about. So just, uh, it's time for me to see what am I now? And then all this generous culture and, and the people who I met, they were so uh, giving me so much chance to accept how I was. I mean, when I think about when I was young, quite ignorant, you know, you had too little understanding with, and uh, I was taking as a gant, just, yeah, but uh, now I feel this, I feel in Europe, middle, yes, like uh, when I went to first time to Finland to, to start your, this, this, uh, uh, New York, Europe in that time, it's called. Then, yeah. And then in Finland. May 90. Yeah, May 90. Mm -hmm. That was something that uh, opened up another part of Europe. But I, I feel that I can speak my language, so to call musical language, naturally in Europe the most. Yeah. yeah. But in America, that all the people who influenced me, they came from. Europe. Europe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah Galhamen and Gallimer and, and, and many others and the Schneiders and, you know, the whole Marlboro crew and uh, even even the ones that were not there, maybe that were born there, like somebody like Gary Grafman, for instance, who was a president actually of Curtis for a number of years. He was the first generation of American born, but he told me at the time you know, I did a program with him for, for the Russian television. He told me that uh, he was born in 24 uh, in America. And four years later, around that time, Curtis finally was formed. And you know how, because there were so many Russian uh, Russian teachers there, mm -hmm. you know, Vingerova, Isabel Vingerova, and of course, Zimbalist, mm -hmm. and uh, Josef Hoffman, and all of these people. So they used to call it, conservatory in exile <laughs> that was <Curtis. laughs> because and there, there was so much russian spoken there because of this and he used to call his teacher who was isabel vingerova uh Tote Belichka vingerova Tote, because they knew each other you know and because his father was the uh the student of our and an older uh friend and colleague of hyphens I mean, it's unbelievable how how all of that, you know, just and of course, uh, Galamian, you know, at the apartment on the tenth floor, seventy third, and uh, and Amsterdam Avenue. That apartment, the same floor, lived the Cherepnins. We did uh, Ivan Cherepnin music, if you remember. The, I think the very first year in nineteen ninety, that was from the same floor in the same apartment, just underneath Galamian. In 9B, where I often stay now at Eric Rame, lived uh, Ksenia Ziloti, Ziloti's daughter. And that's where Rachmaninov used to come because he was her uncle. You know, they, they married two sisters, Stravinsky and all these people. I mean, that, that, was, that was the New York Russian uh, emigre community. Not bad. And Gabrilovich, the awesome Gabrilovich, great cellist, uh, he lived in the same building. So... It's just, uh, you know, it's so close to this whole music history, but it was mostly, you're right, it was mostly European. It was mostly European. Now, coming back to uh, some of the questions. Um, now, a little bit of how, because now, even though you're foreigners, <laughs> but you've, you've now lived in Sweden, for instance, Kati, how, and we keep reading about Sweden, handling the pandemic in a different way. What is it like? Tell us, enlighten us, because you know, Switzerland, that's another story and England is a whole other story. But uh, what is it exactly? What's the Swedish approach? 
how do they how they've been handling it well from the beginning i think the idea was that uh, that closing down the whole society would be so harmful for so many other ways for the people in the society that you should minimize that. You should really think where you close and, and you should leave the rest open. So children should go to school if it's possible because the virus doesn't seem to be as bad for children and, and so on. Yeah. And in that way, I think it's fantastic. It's very good. But then after a pretty short while, uh, the elder care, it showed that it doesn't function at all. Uh, you can't close it and many many workers in there are hired per hour so they go from one elder care center to other they might have five different per day and of course if there is somebody who has the virus then it's everywhere in one day mm -hmm. and they were not given uh, masks or visir or whatever so that's the i think the starting point for the Ouch. terrible death uh, figures you have here and the strange thing is that it's still not much better it is better but it's still not uh, totally addressed to uh, the, the system hasn't changed as much as I think it should have changed and I'm wondering this is very private thought but, but this country hasn't been in war for over 200 years and it, it's the only country in the world and it's That's also the so only uh, Switzerland too. Switzerland is number two, but 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 uh, Sweden is 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 winner. <laughs> yeah, he's the winner. Okay. And I might most... I I wonder if that might might have a, a reason for for the the slowness of action somehow that you expect that oh but it will it will sort it, it cannot be too bad I mean there's nothing bad happening to us ever. <laughs> So this that you really have to decide day one that we do this now and we keep doing it. It's it's really not for for this country. Also, the structure of uh, deciding things here is very um, democratic, and of course this is fantastic. But sometimes when you have to be fast, you don't have time to listen to everybody's opinions, and that's very un-Swedish to not to listen to everybody's opinion. Mm. So. Um, that's interesting. That's an interesting it's, it's observation. A, it's like a mixture of uh, cultural um, history somehow and and also not really being able to be quick enough. And when I when I I talk, of course, with my family in, in Helsinki and uh, and friends and in the beginning, I, I thought it was unbelievable. How can how can uh, the Swedish uh, state betray their citizens this way? But I hope it's not quite that simple. I mean, I, I think I think that the ground the the idea they had from the beginning is a fantastic one, because now we start to see in other countries that when people are unemployed, they are not able to do things they are supposed to do, and they the suffering that is causing is of course a huge thing so and, and a lot of depression and the whole thing exactly. I, I, it's, it's interesting that you said that because i think in music it also reflects uh a certain you know maybe overpowering uh way of uh deciding by committee you know mm -hmm. there's certain things in life especially the crisis situation or creative decisions because i talked to you know on on this program the the, the first guest was my dear friend uh, tony papano who you know you worked with him yeah. in, in, in yeah. brussels yeah and we were talking about i mean is it i said to him i said listen at the end of the day one person writes the piece of music and one person has to decide how it's going to be performed. You cannot have, you know, I could have so many wonderful opinions, especially from, you know, great, uh, you know, friends of mine and AS members. But if I ask, if I have to ask everyone, you know, how we should, what temper should we have? What uh, articulation, how we should interpret it? We'll never, we'll never get anything done. 
it has to be one person who takes responsibility. And if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll be wrong. But I take that responsibility. I think it's a lot harder to do in Scandinavian or orchestras, for instance, in Scandinavia, because they have to have, you know, everybody has to have a say, which is in principle, wonderful democratic principle, but there are situations in life or in the arts where it simply doesn't, doesn't work. You know, you play in, in string trio, you play string trio, so you have three, imagine quartet, which is so famous for having so many different, you know, uh, opinions but somebody has to take responsibility we're going to play it in this tempo we're going to play it in this character and so forth the same thing with the pandemic we got to do it this way chief whatever it is you know medical person it's interesting that you, there's two countries i i haven't thought of it when i thought it would be great combination of you two but you do live in two countries that haven't had a war for a long time and what about Switzerland, Yoko? Could you compare it? Oh, that's what's going on. I put this um, slowness and the federalism and then democracy is over democracy and over federalism. And that's exactly also here. Everybody has something to say, and also we can vote for each tiny thing. I actually, you have no idea that somebody who is a specialist should decide, but they give us chance to vote for that. I mean, this is Everything insane. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm, I think it was a good idea. This also Switzerland, the school has been open for the small children also, mm -hmm. for the uh, university level now. Because small children who has to learn now ABC, how to write and, and pronounce, they have to do at home. No way, Yanni. Yeah. So school has to yeah. I mean, it's, but it's hard, to, it's hard to accept, but this is a collective generation program. We, it's, it's a mentality. It's a mentality of, of people, you know, majority of people never had to endure a war like you had in Japan or like you guys had in Finland, you not so long ago. A, a, a nature, you know, catastrophe, like an earthquake. War. Earthquakes, exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and that sort of brings people together as, as one and you have to, if you, if you go through disasters, I mean, you do feel like, you know, we're all in it together. Like hopefully the world will feel that way now. Just to change the subject to something uh, that we talked about before, I can see that Eric Rame, who you both know, uh, because he's come to some of our tours, an old friend from Juliet, he said, Sally Thomas is still alive and is just about Galamins in the apartment on the 12th floor. I actually, Eric once had a, had a dinner party and invited uh, Sally and her, her partner to have, to have dinner with us. So I, I, after so many decades, <laughs> Sally Thomas, of course, was one of, the, one of Galamins' uh, main assistants and she was in Metamount all the time and everything. So she still lives in the same building. Thank wow. you, Eric. That's, that, that's a good point. So, yeah, we realized that actually, and there is something, it's interesting because that, that, that's a common thing uh, between those countries, Sweden and Switzerland, where you live. But there is also something that I always felt um, in, the, in the mentality and possibly the, uh, the way the Finns listen to music and also the Japanese music mm -hmm. You know, these are the two countries where the words don't necessarily mean that much as let's say in Sweden or in other more, much more verbal cultures and uh, or Chinese cultures, but, but they feel the music in a very, very deep way. And I've experienced that of course, 10 years of festival and then having all the NES tours and all that. And so it's, it's, it's something that you seem so far apart, but in fact, the philosophy and the attitude towards music is not that 
is not that far and uh, in, in terms of. Now, let me, uh, something lighter. Uh, is somebody asking, and he has had some fabulous soloists performing with us. Kisin Argech, Davidovich, Harold, Merck, Repin, Bash, Smith, Hendricks, and so forth, uh, including Bobby McFerry, and Evelyn Glenn, and so forth. Who you wished you had met, but not, but never did, and and why? So, Katya, you go, and then Yoko after that. I th I was really thinking about this, and the, uh, I don't know. I couldn't come up with the with the. I mean, it's enough for me Specific nowadays just to listen just to listen to to the people. I don't have to get to know them <laughs> if That's I if true. I like their, yeah. their music. <laughs> Yeah, I but understand. Is, but you wish we had a one, concert. Yeah. Yeah, there is there is one historical person that actually I would like to. I'm uh, I get more and more curious about what was going on, and that's uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. So there is this like a like a dream that that imagine just to have been able to play with him, to play his stuff. Uh, just to sit next to him occasionally, maybe not all the time. Of course, I would have to be a man then, because at that time, I suppose women okay, yeah. were not doing much or were doing other kind of things. <laughs> exactly. But that's, that's really that's really something I'm 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 thinking of. How is it possible? How did he function? How how is it? I mean, yeah. I I suppose it's the same for us all. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I once spent uh, almost a week teaching uh, a master class at the Bach Academy, which was connected with a competition, which was ha coming a few months later in Leipzig. And it was actually in his house. So I went every morning for a number of hours to teach in Bach's house opposite uh, Thomas Kirche. So that was the place. I felt that I, you know, he was just going to open the door maybe and check it out. And some players were, you know, playing Baroque violins and or some played normal violins, but Baroque bows and this and that. And I was just going to Thomas Kier here like he used to, just crossing that little square mm -hmm. and so forth. It's interesting. There's some uh, extraordinary connections. I, I'm now fascinated by his contemporary, and I'm preparing something on my own because it's all solo violin for the moment. I might transcribe it later on, but uh, Telemann, this is a composer not many people know about, but for instance, uh, Telemann was offered this position in Thomas Kirchner. He turned it down. <laughs> he was the first choice. Then, because he had a better offer in uh, Hamburg, and that's where he stayed for many years. Second choice was also not Bach. Bach was third choice for that position. Imagine. Yeah, and what, what, how the history changed. And it's interesting because Telemann wrote his uh, fantasias. This is what I'm working on just on my own. Now, uh, in 1930, 1735, he wrote. Bach already written all this sonatas and partitas and everything, but they were not known. You know, Bach was not famous in his lifetime. His own children didn't know what an extraordinary giant, alpha and omega of music, was among them. They just thought, well, they are this sort of like, you know, retrograde, he's writing something all this polyphony that's already, you know, that's not in fashion. And one of his sons actually succeeded. He, I think he was also, uh, Telemann was the godfather of Carl Philipp Emanuel. And he succeeded him in his position, in, I think, in Hamburg. So there was, there was an exchange. They knew each other. And Telemann also knew Handel. Bach never met Handel. Bach was always looking up to Handel, thinking, oh, what a wonderful wonderful composer and you know successful and all his you know books would come out and everything i mean it's 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 fascinating yoko what about you who did we miss who we uh, or you missed that, that you wish i, we... I missed it. <laughs> yeah, uh, i don't think you missed I what? anything i think i got you... more than i i deserve 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we had some. I'll tell you what uh, What I missed. Uh, I, not that we ever had a chance, but I wish we had a chance to, from the ones that would be within realm of, of possibility. Radu Lupu is a very special artist. Uh-huh. And he he plays with orchestra sometimes. Now, now he stopped playing altogether. But I mean, I knew Radu uh, sort of socially and I was his admirer for many, many years. He spoke Russian absolutely fluently because he studied in Ohio. He, he was very, very special. And that, I think we would have just adored uh, him uh, mm-hmm. because there was the, the quality of his playing. From the violinist, I don't know. I think we never worked with Zuckerman. I worked with him later on, uh, you know, and Pinky would have been, on a good day, he would have been something something special and also the connection with, with, with Galamin. But, I mean, we did cover the, the, the field pretty, pretty well. <laughs> pretty well. We, we've had That's- a lot of that's actually interesting also because I started to talk about the fact that I, when I was young and started, then I didn't, um, the, the, the way of playing somehow was very, you have to do this and this and yeah. then you have it somehow. And then I came to my the way, orchestra. Or my way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I was sitting next to, or we were three in the beginning, but anyway, uh, Sergei Sotsilovsky was there right. and his bow hand was something I'd, I mean, I, I, it was just like, what's going on? Nobody told me you can do like that. And his, the sound he got out of the instrument was like eight times more than anybody else. It was just amazing. And then also, I mean, Misha Seckler and with his unbelievable vibrato. And I mean, I couldn't, you can hear that on an old recording, but but to really to be there and to see him doing this and and the devotion he had for the music and for for the orchestra and everything is amazing, really. Or Edward Idelchuk, with mm-hmm. his oh, yeah. love of detail and the the phrasing and the breathing of everything. Or um, um, Mick Sterling, who who I mean the way he played the solo in the Dohnani. I mean, every note was gold. It was so beautiful. And all these people, or, or uh, Rustem Gabdulin, how, how oh, he God. could make the, the line, the, you know, it, it, whatever we were playing, he was always alone in the beginning. And, and he just carried us with, with the, the way he was playing the bass line. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I, they were, yeah, yeah, and yeah. The, the, all these people, uh, all of us, we were totally different. Everything was different. And it was because of that partially so fantastic. And for me to, to really so close by uh, see that and uh, be absorbed in it, it was fantastic that there is a way of doing things which is your way of doing things. And that's a good way. You don't have to try to be exactly like your teacher or like some, you know, this, it, it was really a, an eye and ear, ear opener mostly. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then of course there were all I these great, the, the fantastic soloists and uh, all yeah. the, the, you know, I was so young. <laughs> I was mostly interested about the, what's going on around me. I thought already when there is a soloist, it's like, Ooh, oh, is this too far? <laughs> Too far. It was, yeah. was 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 fascinating enough with who was playing exactly. next to you. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was learning much more there behind everybody. <laughs> but also, what, what was I think was also very special that we had all the all the time, at least the principals at that time, but also many others that we had chamber music, you know, or yes. we, we had a chance to play with Marta Argerich and with Bella, with all these guys that I, that I mentioned. I mean, we, we Lynn Harrell, you know, in Seattle exactly. also yeah. was unbelievable. And, and yes. Truls Snork, what a special artist he, he, yes, he absolutely. is. And, you know, yeah, and Vadim Cummings till, you know, 18, 19 or something, you know, with, with playing Bach triple in, in Prague. I don't know whether you remember that famous yeah. Boris's favorite story with, with the Bach triple concerto and all that. I think we have we have something really special to say. 
<laughs> to, to I remember. remember. <laughs> yes. You remember that now. Yeah, I have actually a picture of us from that rehearsal. Right, it looks like this. Yeah, but actually, now he looks like this. At that time, he was he was more after, and we were just yeah, and so many wonderful stories also. Yeah. Now, on the more serious uh, note, what do you think? What's your uh, view? How different you think our music world will be after the pandemic, which seems to really have shaken it to the core? And especially with young people, that's that's been quite devastating. What what will be different? The way, just your take, your personal take. It doesn't have to be, you know, a prediction. It's not a it's not a sport prediction. You know, you don't have to get any points for that. What 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 do you think could be a positive thing, and what we'll have to just learn and get used to it. Yoko, you start. Yeah, I think it's just, it will be so wonderful for the audience to, to be pleasant with, with the, as an audience and, uh, and have a live concert, you know? It's, this is something, it's, you can't have it through the microphone. And then also, I think individual, these uh, uniform things, uh, way of uh, music making, just to be, to go with, yeah, the, I think individualism is, is asked for it. And then I think this is, uh, people will choose for the, their own taste. They will not, just uh, take anything. I think it's, it's, it's good. Everybody was so starving now on diet to, to go. And now when something comes, you want to have your own taste. You want to pick, I hope. It's yeah. overfilling is no good. That's, that's yeah. uh, too much junk food around it was, I think. <laughs> that, that that is true i mean but that now we've got another extreme now we have almost nothing is available and whatever is available is on internet these days uh but when you finally get to the real life music making you we certainly do feel how special what we've been doing that we should any more ever in our lives anyway my generation uh, what we're doing for granted. Oh, yeah, well, that's another performance. No, it's a performance. So lucky we're in the same room together and we, we can exchange that invisible, you know, energy and fluids of music, of, you know, energy exchange, thoughts, emotions, uh, feelings. You know, we could, we could really uh, share our pain, our sorrow, our of joys and all these things become a very special like you know in a way every time NAS got together that's how we felt it was a time of elation you know as something that oh we're together we're making music together and we can we can spend the whole time together whether we're eating whether we talking walking you know carrying on telling jokes but we are exchanging our energy and that's, I think that's part of it. This is what's been cut. I mean, we're doing our best by doing the, all these things online and we're staying alive. And many of us really uh, value this as the best, the next best thing we can do to stay together. It's certainly much better than if everybody's just separated and, you know, no. But I hope also audience, what you were saying, will appreciate that a concert it's not something you could go to a concert or maybe watch a movie or maybe watch television, maybe play cards, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> do something. No, going to a concert becomes an event mm -hmm. because I will get something that I will never get anywhere else because it will be a live exchange of emotions. That's, I think if that's 
uh, what will be the lesson of this. And because it'll be much rarer, now it's 25% or 50% at the most in some countries, some of it no, no, no public at all, it's just streaming, which is not quite the same thing, because I believe that we need to have three elements. In the in a, in a, in a concert, in the live performance has to be great piece of music, great performers, and the audience. Those are three legged stool. Without the audience, it's not quite the performance. We can do our best, but there's no feedback. There's no energy that being exchanged. So I think if that happens, what about you, Kati? What what do you think we should uh, take home and what are the hopes and uh, uh, how do you think it's going to it's going to come in uh, how different also because you are actively in the opera house in the orchestra plus everything else that you do I think uh, on a plus side this uh, internet activity everything will continue and I hope it will develop also that you will have more um things that are created for this, are created for the, that, that, that they become things that you cannot do live, that you somehow have uh, operas or performances or whatever on the net, but, but specifically for the net. But then again, I'm a bit worried for the institutions who of course now need money that they would think that, okay, the way of getting back, back everybody is to just play Beethoven, Mahler, and uh, mm -hmm. Mozart, maybe a little bit of Haydn, so that you somehow keep doing, keep um, doing the other things also that the modern composers, the now living composers, and the, the newly dead composers, and yet, that you don't lose the contact of, of what's going on now just because uh, finances maybe, maybe it feels too risky or whatever. I mean, I think it would be such a great opportunity for us to, to actually become more uh, of, of an element in our time to, to play more of what is going on now, to, to show people what there is because also if we don't do the work, if we don't find the great pieces which are not played, then nobody will. Oh, there's not, the public is not coming, the audience is, is not coming with the unplayed uh, pieces and asking us to do them. We have to, we have to take care of the, the inheritance, not only with these big guys, but also with a lot of other stuff, which is very interesting. Like you're doing with the Telemann, I mean, Telemann is of course known, but, but, but but people who are alive now, and also the composers, geez, they need, they need also to be played for public, for audience. And they need us, because ultimately we really exist primarily. And originally, that's how performers as a class uh, was created, is to play mu new music. You know? Uh, yeah. Razumovsky hired a string quartet and they were all on his payroll to have a quartet in residence to play all new Beethoven quartets, not just those three, Razumovsky. He had yeah. that quartet on salary, ready, anytime Beethoven would write something new. You know, that's it. And Beethoven quartet, much uh, 150 years later, uh, the called Beethoven Quartet, Russian Quartet, were the ones who played every Shostakovich Quartet. Yeah. Apart from other things that they did, but that was the, that's what they will be known, believe me. Hmm. They will not be known for playing Beethoven Quartets because there were other quartets, maybe better even than them, but they will go down in history because every Shostakovich new quartet they played it first in his apartment for the last 20 years that he lived in that. I've been there. I mean, his, his widow, I'm, I'm quite friendly, and she's very nice to invite me and even some of the guests that I brought. Everything was played in that uh, piano room, you know, the first, first performance. So they were there, even not that far removed from my generation, because I knew them. 
uh, Tsiganov and Chilinsky and 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 then Druzhinin who became the uh, and and of course all of them. That was their function. Is to play yeah. whatever new quartets to come in, and I think we forget that because uh, we all think that you know somehow we're so sure Amelis, that the way we play Tchaikovsky concerto or Brahms concerto it's never been played before. Yeah, if you go on stage, you have to think that way. Otherwise, <laughs> stay home and don't play it. But <laughs> you know, probably a few giants before us who walked on stage and who performed and whose recordings we have, they probably had a few few good things to say about those pieces. So don't 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 flatter yourself. But you could do something incredibly useful. And I think coming back to our virtual experience, it's very interesting. We're now about to uh, finish the new cycle of Bach dance suite. Yeah, the first dance suite. In, in, in mostly in G and G and, and C that we've met, have made now seven, seven one is coming. And this is gonna be the second suite of seven. But believe it or not, the Desetnik of Bukovina suite been seen and heard by much more people than the Bach. As much as we love and we do our absolute best. So there is a public for that. Of course, of course. Just on my on my Facebook page, uh, there are more than combined for seven seven sweet seven pieces, uh, and they're two to three minutes long, really. Uh, three and a half, I think, is the longest. But anyway, there are more than two hundred thousand views of Desetnikov, yeah. and this is not a household name, no. you know, outside of Russia. Some people know him, but mostly, it's so. The, but it struck, uh, you know, a certain chord. And we have now the whole army of 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 Ukrainian and and Romanian uh, fans who feel that this is their music. You know, Bukovina is, is where they live. This is part of their country. So that's great, and that's how it should be, because you know, if they feel sense of belonging, wonderful. So that's so. I think maybe the internet and uh, the possibility of you know no borders and no danger before you come to a live concert maybe you you and the chances are better uh maybe through internet and then to bring it to the concert hall yeah you, but your fears are absolutely uh correct because mm -hmm. normally a knee-jerk reaction you know when you draw or Let's just do Beethoven fifth or Tchaikovsky fifth or something like that. You know the the famous pieces. The, of course, public should be should be lucky just to get to the hall and hear something live. Because I had goosebumps uh, when I was in Prague, and it'd been at that point just about six months I hadn't heard orchestra live. Whatever the, that Prague ra radio orchestra played was just like goosebumps. Mm. Just the sound, oh, of those woodwinds and then the, the brass and the strings and in that beautiful, I mean, as a listener, I thought, oh, just died and went to heaven. It's, an, it's incredible how much we forget how, how, what it means really, even just viscerally, just physically. Listen, so on, there's still lots of questions, but I think we should probably, uh, so Mimi Sunas Tom, of course, is sending her love. And uh, so this is the day to celebrate friendship, love of friends. And I certainly celebrate you too. And in your, uh, you know, ambassadorial, uh, uh, you know, role, my beloved NAS, members who've been absolutely the source of joy and sustained me in my seemingly undying optimism or enthusiasm, but you part of it because if I didn't have that uh, connection and I didn't, if I didn't feel needed that you're actually waiting for my new transcriptions and for the new to the next piece to record together. And then I get a phone call from Boris and said, let's have uh, you know, a session where I 
play, you watch, you play, I watch, let's coordinate the boings and let's send this and then comes from Boris this and for me this. It's fantastic. It seems like we've never been closer, even though we, we all live in our houses. But the distance is also, it's a relative thing. As long as we have the distance, closeness of the hearts, of our minds, and of music, I think we will, we will be okay. So thanks a lot. Really, lots of love. And we'll get together before too long when this whole thing goes away. In the meantime, we'll continue to stay together and make music distantly as long as we can breathe. <laughs> Lots of love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.